Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's lecture where we begin our section on Puerto Rican migrants. Uh, this week, we look at how early uh, we've had Puerto Ricans coming to the United States um, and what and who these migrants uh, were. So these early migrants included merchants and traders, pro-independence organizers, and working class migrants. The merchants and traders uh, came as a result of commerce and trade with the United States, which originally meant smuggling and clandestine trades. Technically, Puerto Ricans were not allowed to trade with other nations at this time. Puerto Rico is under the rule of Spain, um, and Spain for, uh, forbade Puerto Rico from being able to trade with other countries. However, smuggling and illegal trade have been part of the Puerto Rican economic history since around the 1700s because there were times when Spain ignored or neglected Puerto Rico and did not send necessary supplies. This tra trade was based on the exchange of sugar and molasses for basic food staples that Spain failed to provide to the Puerto Rican people. As uh, one of the earliest organizations, therefore, that was created by this particular group was the Spanish Benevolent Society in 1830. Another group that uh, came to the United States in the early 1800s were pro-independence organizers um, who were not allowed or was illegal for them to organize from Puerto Rico. So many of them would come to the United States, particularly New York City, um, and organize there for the goal of independence for Puerto Rico. Um, some of these early leaders included Eugenio Maria de Hostos and Jose Martí, who was from Cuba. At this point, Cuba and Puerto Rico were allies in trying to gain independence from Spain. The organizations uh, founded by Cubans and Puerto Ricans in New York um, at this time organized specifically for independence efforts. Uh, the third type of uh, migrant that came at this time were working class migrants, particularly cigar workers. Cigar workers were a, a large contingent of working class folks in Puerto Rico at this time. And many of them were polit politically leftist. Um, so they often were also involved in uh, independence efforts. And in the uh, image here, you see what a workshop will look like in Puerto Rico uh, for cigar workers. As we saw in the reading, ideologies of manifest destiny serve to justify colonization of Puerto Rico, as seen in this quote by business writer Amos Fisk in a New York Times editorial published in July, 1898. In the first quote, he states, Providence has decreed that it shall be ours, it being Puerto Rico, as a recompense for smiting the last withering clutch of Spain from the domain which Columbus brought to light and the fairest part of which has long been our own heritage. So here he is explaining um, how it was uh, the U.S. fate to always have uh, Puerto Rico. About the Puerto Rican labor force, he stated, there are many blacks, possibly a third of all the people and much mixed blood, but the population is not ignorant or indolent or in any way degraded. It is not turbulent or intractable. And there's every reason to believe that under encouraging conditions, it will become industrious, thrifty and prosperous. So one of the concerns at this time was about race and whether there were uh, too many black people in Puerto Rico and whether and how this might um, affect the United States. Um, and so a part of his um, article was about appeasing the US uh, public about this population and how they were basically able to be, in a sense, trainable to be good, prosperous, um, industrious labor. And finally, about Puerto Rico, he states, a venerable garden of the tropics and an especially charming winter resort for denizens of the north. So here he is selling the island as sort of this vacation spot for the wealthy in the United States. In this quote, we see the proclamation by General Miles when his army first arrives to the uh, island and quote unquote, liberates the island. And um, it's interesting to look at the quote closely and look at the kind of language that is being used. 
And so the quote states, the chief object of the American military forces will be to overthrow the armed authority of Spain and to give to the people of your beautiful island the largest measure of liberties consistent with this military occupation. We have not come to make war against the people of a country that for centuries has been oppressed, but on the contrary, to bring you protection, not only to yourselves, but to your property, to promote your prosperity and to bestow upon you the immunities and blessings of the liberal institutions of our government. It is not our purpose to interfere with any existing laws and customs that are wholesome and beneficial to your people, as long as they conform to the rules of military administration of order and justice. This is not a war of devastation, but one to give all within the control of its military and naval forces the advantages and blessings of enlightened civilization. So what you see here is some sort of contradictory language. On the one hand, they say that they are giving the island liberty as long as it's consistent with the military occupation. That right seems a little bit contradictory there. Um, again, talking to them about um, you know, we're not here to change your laws um, as long as they conform to military administration. So they're sort of on the one hand saying, we're not here to change anything, we're here to liberate you, but we're going to be military occupying you for a while. And so your laws, how we treat you and so on has to be consistent with the military occupation. It is not from 1898 until 1900 um, when a government is created for uh, the island of Puerto Rico. So for two years, they are under uh, military occupation. And the Foraker Act is the act that creates a form of government for the island in 1900. And these were the elements of the government. Uh, the governor, there will be a governor, like we have governors in the states in the United States, but the people will not elect them. This person, the person will be appointed by the US president. There would be an executive council, which performed legislative and executive functions and was also appointed by the US president. Five of the 11 members of the executive council were Puerto Rico natives. The House of Delegates had 35 elected members. Local legislation could be vetoed by the governor, the US president, or the US Congress. Puerto Ricans were stripped of Spanish citizenship at this time, but they were not granted U.S. citizenship. So during this time period, they're kind of in a limbo because they don't belong to any particular um, nation and don't have a, a national status um, as citizens. The economic policies of the Foraker Act um, in, included prohibiting Puerto Rico from negotiating its own treaties with other countries. Uh, Puerto Rico was part of the U.S. monetary system, and all ships, uh, uh, all goods shipped to Puerto Rico had to be transported on U.S. owned ships. The primary crop became sugar with major centrales owned by U.S. corporations. So subsistence family farming declined, replacing local food with imports. This image is a famous image that we see around this time in newspapers throughout the United States, um, really uh, depicting US-Puerto Rico relations, but also if you look at the image more broadly, the relationship between Uncle Sam and other populations in the United States. So in the front, you see these um, dark skinned children that represent the uh, different uh, colonies that the US acquires during this time, Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. Um, but then towards the back, you see that there are girls um, in the uh, a school, but then you see who's at the margins as well of uh, Uncle Sam's um, uh, uh, education, right, or civilization. You have the black uh, uh, person caricature cleaning the windows, the Native American uh, individual in the back towards uh, the door and outside the door, that individual is supposed to represent um, Asian populations in the United States. So it really sort of um, captures this um, uh, uh, colonizing kind of relationship that the United States has with all sorts of different populations, not just these new colonies that they have just acquired. Now, one of the complications, as I mentioned before, was around citizenship and how Puerto Rico would be defined. And so in 1901, the Supreme Court ruled Puerto Rico as what was known as a non-incorporated territory. 
So this meant that US constitutional provisions and protections did not apply automatically to the people of Puerto Rico. And this idea of the constitution not following the flag arose during this time. Now, there were a number of different uh, cases from 1901 on that were um, testing, right, what aspects of Puerto, of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rican government, Puerto Rico economy were um, consistent with the United States and which ones were not consistent with U.S. law. Um, and so one of these was the 1904 case of Isabel Gonzalez, who came to the U.S. on a ship um, and was detained on Ellis Island and was not allowed um, to enter the uh, United States because she was not considered a um, citizen, uh, but an alien immigrant. So Isabel Gonzalez was a young woman who landed in New York and was not allowed to disembark because she was considered a foreigner uh, with discretion given to immigration authorities over whether the immigrant will be a desirable presence in the US. There was concern over her becoming a public charge because she arrived pregnant and without a husband. So you also see here the gender dynamics in terms of uh, immigration policy. Uh, the case was against William Williams, and that was his real name, the immigration commissioner who had instituted this policy while the ship was en route. So the, the law policy changes while she's on the way here. In the series of cases and appeals, she tried to prove that she would not become a public charge. Her tactics shifted in the Supreme Court case, arguing that because Puerto Rico not belonged to the US, Puerto Ricans were American citizens by default and should be able to travel between island and mainland. The court created the ambiguous status where yes, Puerto Ricans should be allowed to travel freely and were considered American nationals, but not American citizens. And so this again, sort of, uh, uh, upheld the idea of this ambiguous status for Puerto Ricans during this time. So she was eventually allowed to come uh, uh, to land in the US um, and this case allowed then for Puerto Ricans to be able to travel to the US, um, but that didn't mean that they were citizens. Citizenship did not come until 1917 through the Jones Act, uh, which uh, gave Puerto Ricans US citizenship it also made some changes to the local government um, where they restructured uh, uh, instead of executive council and house of delegates, they restructured into a house and Senate uh, a structure just like we have here in the US. The right to vote was extended to all males 21 years or older uh, with no literacy or property requirements. But again, this was to vote in local elections, not to vote for governor or for the US president. A governor, the governor, attorney general, auditor, and commissioner of education were still presidentially appointed. The executive council now functioned as the governor's cabinet and was still appointed by the president of the United States. During World War I, now uh, Puerto Ricans have become citizens. Um, and so the military draft is extended to Puerto Rico after the Jones Act passes. They were required to register for military service. So this meant that Puerto Ricans participated in World War I. 241,000 Puerto Rican men registered for military service. 17,855 were inducted into the army. However, none fought at the European front. 4,000 were sent to protect the Panama Canal. Approximately 20 Afro-Puerto Ricans residing in New York at the time served in a segregated black only unit. In 1920, the Merchant Marine Act, which also is called the Jones Act of 1920, required that all vessels bringing goods to Puerto Rico must be American made, American owned, and American flagged. This was the most expensive maritime system in the world, which leads to higher cost of goods and has a negative impact during crisis moments, as we will discuss later on when we talk about Hurricane Maria. Now, one of the consistent discourses around the Puerto Rican economy since this early time period was that the problem with Puerto Rico was that there were too many people. 
And so this quote from Governor Arthur Yates, who was the governor in 1915, kind of captures what the predominant idea about Puerto Rican population was at this time. There is much wretchedness and poverty among the masses of the people of Puerto Rico. Undoubtedly, the fundamental cause is the enormous population. I do not hesitate to express my belief that the only really effective remedy is the transfer a lot of large numbers of Puerto Ricans to some other region. So what we see from this very early time period is that there was always this desire to encourage uh, migration of Puerto Ricans from the island as a way to ease the pressure on the economy there. So this means that we have some very early migrations happening at this time. Um, <clears throat> Some of their ex common experiences, uh, com the common experience of uh, early mi migration, including the seeking of cheap labor, uh, experiences of racism and discrimination, and not welcomed as community members. So many of the stories and anecdotes that we have from this time period of these early Puerto Rican migrants that went throughout different parts of the United States and Hawaii. Um, is that they are welcomed by corporations because of their cheap labor, but they might, when they try to sort of um, uh, become part of the local uh, community and society, they are rejected. <clears throat> so one of the early populations of migrations that we have is in, to Hawaii between 1900 and 1901. U.S. corporations also recruited laborers to Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and Mexico. So we have Puerto Ricans going not just to parts of the U.S., but also to other parts of uh, Latin America where there were U.S. corporations there. Now, some of the reasons why we now have contract labor um, uh, targeting Puerto Rican workers at this time is because the Johnson Act, uh, which was an immigration uh, law that passed in the 1920s, limited European immigration. And so many of the immigrants that came during this time period from Europe were working class immigrants that, that uh, worked to many of the working class and service jobs in the United States. But this acts limits that migration from Europe. And so we need to replace those workers that we're now uh, uh, not getting from Europe. And so Puerto Rican laborers become um, uh, a good source of replacement labor because now they're citizens. So they can easily be brought to the United States um, and replace European immigrants in different types of labor. And so this increases the recruitment of contract labor from Puerto Rico. Now, as I mentioned, one of the earliest migrations was to Hawaii at this point. And part of the reason why the laborers are being recruited to Hawaii is because of some of the commonalities between Hawaii in terms of weather, um, but also in terms of the kind of labor that they needed. They needed laborers to work in sugar plantations and sugar was one of the major crops that Puerto Ricans were used to working on in the island. So there are a number of different um, reasons and uh, uh, events that happen that make it possible for Puerto Ricans to become um, a good source of labor. So first is that there's a hurricane in 1899, Hurricane San Siriaco, which considerably devastates the islands, especially some of their coffee and sugar crops. And so now you have all these people who don't have their own um, crops to farm um, and are search of uh, work. The Chinese Exclusion Act, which uh, was passed in 1882, limited Chinese immigration. And so in Hawaii, one of the, so their sources of labor had been China. And so again, we have uh, a source of labor that now is uh, depleted because of an immigration law. And so Puerto Ricans become replacement labor. Hawaii Sugar Planters Association um, therefore needs workers. Um, and so turn to Puerto Rico for our recruitment of labor. The another reason why Puerto Ricans become attractive at this time to Hawaii, to the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association, is because their Japanese and Chinese workers were starting to unionize and organize themselves. And so the idea was that is to bring Puerto Rican workers who were, had a completely different culture, completely different language, as a way to under, undermine this labor organizing that was happening.
So one of the ways in which the Hawaii Sugar Planters Association creates some animosity towards uh, Puerto Ricans um, as a way to sort of keep them under control was through using the media, manipulating stereotypical images um, such as uh, Puerto Ricans being aggressive, knife wielders, lazy, irresponsible, and unreliable. They also manipulated ethnic tensions among plantation workers, housing Puerto Ricans near Japanese, near their Japanese workers, which had significant cultural differences. They also paid Puerto Ricans slightly higher and gave them slightly better housing, again, to um, create tensions and animosities between these different populations so that they wouldn't come together um, under a common labor banner. Portuguese workers were also part of the labor force at this time, but they were made foremen to create competition and tension. So there's a hierarchy among the different ethnic groups that is created on the sugar plantations in order to control all right, and manipulate their, um, their uh, involvement with each other. Now, Puerto Rican culture in Hawaii is discussed in terms of two terms, cultural syncretism, a form of mixing where original characteristics are not lost in the process of transculturation. Um, so this results in ethnic culture, for example, traditional holidays, food, and music. But it's also defined by cultural synthesis, a blend of many cultural elements that creates something new based on local Hawaiian culture. So that, um, so that the Puerto Rican community in Hawaii both uphold certain traditions like food and music, but also have adapted to local cultural mixing, for example, using pidgin English. So the ways that Puerto Rican cultures are upheld in, in Hawaii includes a celebration of traditional holidays through music and food and creating cultural organizations dedicated to upholding music and folkloric dances as you see in one of the videos that I have posted for this week. Some of the challenges to upholding Puerto Rican culture include intermarriage, um, last names changed to Portuguese spelling, and younger generations feeling disconnected from their language, history, and culture, and who identify therefore more with local Hawaiian culture. Um, but this population is very interesting because again, this population has been there since the early 1900s. And so you have generations of uh, these Puerto Ricans who have grown up and been part of Hawaii since then, but at the same time, continue to identify themselves with this early Puerto Rican history and culture. So this ends our lecture for this week. I look forward to your thoughts about the, this material. Have a wonderful week.